I guess I'll uh, try and kick things off. Uh, welcome to a, another episode of Robotics <laughs> Seminar. It's uh, <laughs> the reality show. Uh, we haven't tried. We haven't tried voting people off of the island yet. But, uh, <laughs> gong show. Oh, the Gong Show. The Gong Show. Okay. That's how it's <laughs> Well, uh, so this week I'm uh, thrilled uh, that we have managed to entice Naomi Leonard to come and talk to us. Um, I think many of you know of her work, uh, and it's something that I guess everybody is interested in, which is uh, how on earth can uh, uh, swarms of little things be so smart? Uh, there's, even the little things are smarter than our robots, and the swarms of them are even smarter than that. Is that right? Is this what you were going to say? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but Naomi, uh, let's see, I, I made some notes. She is the Edwin S. Wilsey Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton. She is a four times a fellow. That might be the most I know. IEEE, SIAM, IFAC, and ASME. And she has uh, she is MacArthur Fellow, and there are other things that I could say, but I'm sure you're uh, sick of hearing of all of her honors. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, join me in welcoming Naomi Lynn. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about bio-inspired dynamics for multi-agent decision making. And as you may know well, um, control theory, for example, as well as other kinds of tools, gives us uh, methods for generalizing across a, a wide variety of systems so that we can answer questions about fundamental trade-offs, for example, in robustness or in accuracy or in efficiency um, and more. But as uh, systems operate in increasingly complex environments. Um, we actually are facing uh, critical uh, trade-offs that we don't yet know precisely how to address. For example, how is it that systems can be reliably stable in the presence of disturbance and yet also flexible and adaptive uh, in the face of, ch of a changing environment? Um, so, so my perspective is, well, I mean, there's lots of ways to think about this kind of problem, but I think we have a lot to learn from nature. And um, I want to um, sort of convince you of that and then give you my take on that. I mean, I think number one reason is that natural systems, at least from what we can observe, um, balance flexibility with stability, this, this, this difficult trade-off remarkably well. Um, I think also, when I say learning from nature, I think learning from people who study nature is also part of the story because what we find, at least uh, from my own experience, is that collaborating with natural scientists or um, social scientists, even artists uh, who think about human behavior, um, is really generative in the sense that the questions that we ask as control theorists or dynamicists or roboticists can be informed by the questions they ask. They might be looking at similar stories but asking different questions which can inform our questions, can inform our theory, can inform our practice. Um, and then a third point as a sort of control theory person I feel um, if you look around at all these natural systems, feedback is everywhere. And so I think you know, we who you know, think about feedback um, are in a good position to start thinking about uh, what we can learn from these natural, natural systems. And so today I'm going to talk about um, this idea of flexibility and stability, but in the, the context of, um, of sort of the remarkable ability of, of, of animal groups. Um, uh, to, to carry out what they do um, flexibly and stably. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how we think about that um, in, a, in a generalized framework so that we can apply it to design of multi-agent uh, systems. And I'm going to put forward an idea um, that, that instability um, uh, is maybe a route or a path to thinking about um, what I'm going to think of as like a transition between, a flexible transition between a stable 
solution and another stable solution. So I'm going to talk about instability as a driver for this, this trade-off. So uh, let me first just tell you what I mean by multi-agent system. So I mean a, a collection of individuals, and so we'll call each individual an agent. And I'm going to think about these multi-agent systems in which each agent can, um, on its own, uh, measure something about its environment, mi which might include something about the others around it, um, can um, uh, move it or, or actuate itself on its own, um, and can respond to what it measures uh, about the environment. So underwater vehicles or these ground, these um, uh, wheeled vehicles, or there's a, um, these are aerial aerial vi vehicles uh, dropping fire retardant on a fire, even like a, a power network. Um, these are multi-agent systems if each vehicle or each windmill has you know, computer sensors and actuators. Um, in the same way, animal groups are multi-agent systems because each animal in the group can sense something about its environment, including some of the others, can, um, can make its decisions in response to what it senses, and can actually can, can fly or swim. Uh, in, this, in these examples. And, and the questions are, there are some parallels in the questions. So um, in the, the case of uh, the engineered systems, we'd like to figure out how to design dynamics or control laws for the individual so that at the level of the collective, we uh, get this kind of uh, s uh, robust yet flexible behavior. Um, in the context of the animal groups, you know, biologists are seeking to understand what are the mechanisms at the individual level that explain this robust and flexible behavior at the level of the group. And in both cases, you have, you know, you may have some limitations that are very different, but you have these fundamental limitations on in individuals and what an individual can sense and what an individual can compute and what an, an individual can um, communicate or do um, in, both, in both settings. Um, so I just want to start with this pretty video which I stole off the web um, because I think here you can kind of see a group of fish uh, responding in this very smooth way um, in a, I think of a flexible um, yet robust uh, to something that's going on in the environment because first they get into this 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 you know toroidal the spiraling motion and then something must happen in the environment because they're going to transition very smoothly into a kind of a polarized motion and you know you know, to explain these kinds of behaviors, the, the biologists use um, a, a variety of different models. This is a, I also stole this from the web, but this is a, a common um, sort of sensing model. So like a focal fish might have roles that make it repel from anybody who's too close, make it attracted to somebody who's a little bit too far, but they can still sense, and then align with anybody who's at a nice, say, body, a body length away. And you know, these are just a couple of examples of really lovely papers. So Danny Grunbaum showed that um, uh, using a, a model as simple as this, that a group um, could find the source of, a, of a, like a plume in a very turbulent environment in such a way that an individual couldn't do that. So they're using these kinds of behaviors to sort of climb this, this noisy uh, gradient. In this paper by uh, Ian Cousin and company, they showed that you could actually see these smooth transitions from you know, circular motions and, and uh, polarized motions just by simple parameter changes like the, like the, the um, radius of that alignment <coughs> zone. Um, and so here I wanted to show you some of the kinds of things, this is way back when, so this was a long time ago, that I did with colleagues and students um, where we were inspired by just these kinds of uh, ideas um, of you know, getting so much more out of the group than one could get out of individuals. And so we developed um, a methodology and algorithms for um, controlling um, uh, networks of um, sensors. This was for work on mobile sensor networks in the ocean. And we demonstrated um, in two big field experiments in Monterey Bay, California with a, a group of uh, these underwater robotic uh, gliders. Um, so, so for example, oh, here's a little video of what the gliders look like. Uh, so these are like a meter and a half long. Um, they have no propellers. They, they control their motion through changing uh, their weight and redistributing mass. Um, so in the top figure I'm showing you back in 2003, what we did was develop algorithms uh, for uh, controlling uh, formations. So what you're going to look at here in this video of, of about 12 hours of the experiment, I don't even know if you can see the, the vertices of the triangle 
are the gliders themselves, and they're going up and down as they move, and you're going to see them moving in the plane. Um, but the idea was that we were showing how we could make a formation dilate and translate and rotate um, in order to do things like estimate gradients, climb gradients in the field that they were measuring. So each could only take a scalar measurement, say, of temperature, and they're actually, well, they went from six kilometers apart to three kilometers apart. Uh, to uh, be able to adjust their, their resolution so that they could climb, say, a temperature gradient, um, which they couldn't do as an individual. So this was about 12 hours in the southern part of Monterey Bay. There were lots of pretty strong currents going on. Um, something we did uh, a few years later, actually motivated by some experiences back then, was to think about um, not just formations, but motion patterns. So here the idea was that we developed a whole methodology for um, a sort of a simply parameterized method to stabilize a uh, network of these, uh, these uh, uh, vehicles to move into motion patterns so that we could optimize, maximize the information in the data that we were collecting. Okay, so this had to do with spacing them so that they would be consistent with the spatial and temporal le length scales in the fields that we were measuring, like temperature or salinity. Um, and so you can see that over the course of the month, they were, these were auto, this was automated for 25 days straight. Um, and they're, they're moving um, in, along these colored patterns. The, the vector field you see in the back is an estimate from the, the data collected by the gliders of the flow field. So they get pushed around a lot. Um, but they're trying to coordinate their motion. The gray lines show you who's dancing with whom at, at, at any given moment. I mean, this... this um, has motivated me. So more recently, we've been looking at these problems. I like to think of the, the gradient climbing one as sort of like exploiting the data that we're collecting. And the, the second example is kind of like exploring, because we're trying to minimize uncertainty in this field that we're sampling. And so more recently, we've been looking at putting those problems together uh, for search uh, using the multi-arm bandit framework. So this is the idea that if you have a distributed resource and you discretize uh, your space, you can think about each cell of your discretization as an option. And when you sample it, it's like you, you get a reward, or you get a measurement, but it might be a noisy measurement. And the question is, how do, how do I explore and exploit um, and maximize the information I'm collecting? So if it's like spilled oil in the Gulf of Mexico, how do I make sure I go to places where there's high concentration? Um, and so this is just a demonstration of this in the case where we, uh, we did a lot of work in trying to understand how humans make these decisions. And so we looked at um, generalizations of multi-arm bandit problems with Bayesian decision makers who in particular would have uh, a prior on their correlation uh, that could be defined in terms of like the distance uh, between, uh, like the spatial distance between two options divided by this length scale lambda. So you can see um, in my, this is a big 20,000 gallon tank I have in my lab at Princeton, uh, three different um, uh, robotic implementations of a multi-arm bandit algorithm. In each case, the individual robot has a different um, measurement, or a different prior on that lambda on the spatial scale. So the guy at the top is going to do way more exploring than the guy on the bottom because he doesn't realize that the, the resource is clumpy, <laughs> thinks he has to check out every single option. Um, we've also um, brought this into the world of collective behavior. So this is a, a, a similar kind of experiment. So now I have, there are 20 options here again. Um, uh, there, uh, uh, I didn't tell you this, but in the previous case, the color scale tells you what the re reward magnitude is. So the red here is the, is the highest reward. It's the one that maybe has the most spilled oil or the highest temperature. Um, and so now we think about how um, agents um, uh, communicate information. And so this is like the multiplayer, multi-agent um, uh, problem where they're searching these options. And in this case, it's a directed communication. So the green guy is getting information from the purple guy, um, but the purple guy is not hearing anything back from the green guy. So the green guy gets to sort of sit pretty on the best option. Every once in a while goes to the second best option, that bright yellow one, whereas the um, the purple guy has to do all the exploring from him. But we're, in, we're interested in sort of the role of the network structure. If you have a whole bunch of these, how you how they should and can collaborate um, and do better as individuals and as a group. Okay, so th that was meant as sort of background because the problem I want to talk to you today is I, I think sort of 
somewhat even more fundamental, which is, you know, in that setting, say in the ocean where we were moving around, we had the vehicles moving around these patterns, you know, how, how is it that we could get the group even to make like the fundamental decision to switch the pattern? When we switched those patterns, that was human in the loop. We, we had some, every couple days we could switch the pattern out. But what if I wanted the group to decide, oh, the currents had changed, we should be going the other way, or maybe we should you know, move a little bit offshore because something interesting is happening and just change the plan. So how do we enable a group of sort of distributed individuals um, to make a decision all together? Um, I mean, all kinds of problems, like has a change been detected? Which direction to go? Which alternative is true? Which action to take? And the idea is that the animals do this, and they do this flexibly and robustly. Um, and so, so my question is, can we, um, can we somehow abstract out something fundamental about the mechanisms that live over here so that we can um, connect up through this, this abstraction, this model, to the design problem and even go back and forth. If we learn something here, it might help us ask new questions about the biology or the biology might um, be extrapolated. We might be able to go outside, and in fact, we probably should go outside the parameter ranges inside here. But if we can abstract out, then we'll have this platform to make these kinds of connections. Um, so this is what I want to tell you. And I'm going to start by giving you a little background on two studies of animal groups. One um, is fish and one is honeybees. Um, and I want to um, uh, show you how these, in these two stories of fish and honeybees, um, instability uh, through, bifur through a bifurcation is really key to thinking about the flexible and robust behavior. And so I'm, I'm just showing you a pitchfork bifurcation. In fact, I'm going to be talking about pitchfork bifurcations today. And so, so what I mean is, this is a plot of the solution to the dynamics as a function of a, of a parameter um, so, uh, that changes on the x-axis. So to the left, we see we have one stable solution. For us, it's going to be like sort of indecision, can't decide between the two options. And then as that parameter increases, we go through this sort of critical, this singularity, essentially. Um, and at that singularity, so it's at the origin here, um, that originally stable solution becomes unstable and we get these two new s stable solutions, right? Um, and so, in fact, this is a very symmetric story and it's actually through these kinds of symmetries that one can uh, find a lot of these symmetric bifurcations. So here, it might mean for us that say the value of, of two alternatives is equal and we're trying to choose between them. Or it could be that we have two alternatives and we have two equal sized subgroups, uh, one preferring one alternative and one preferring the other alternative. So that would be another kind of symmetry that would lead us to this kind of pitchfork bifurcation. But the theory behind bifurcation, this singularity theory, for example, allows us then to understand what happens when we break the symmetry. So what happens when there are perturbations. So we want to think about the symmetries as kind of like a normal form, a place to start, and then we want to understand what happens in the more complex setting where we, we don't have those, um, those symmetries. So for example, singularity theory, uh, which I'll t tell you a little bit more about for bifurcations, is it's called an organizing robust uh, bifurcation theory. It tells us, in fact, for the pitchfork bifurcations, all possible kinds of perturbations from that picture in fact, you can only get four different kinds of pictures. This is one of them, um, which you can see looks kind of like that. Um, and so this is uh, going to play a big role um, in the story today. And I think we can take it even a step further. So, so um, you know, if you think about this, the, you know, I told you that every point along here is, is a steady state solution, a solution of the system, um, which is, seems very static. And I'm talking about dynamic systems. So, so, so the idea here is that if we Think about this as, say, like a control gain, a control parameter, and we design some dynamics for this. Then we turn something that um, that is, is very static into a, a, like an, a, a controlled adaptive response. So we could have this parameter move in response to some kind of trigger from the environment, for example. Okay, so that's kind of a summary of, of what I'm going to tell you today. So let me start um, by by talking about this fish story. Um, or maybe not. <laughs> We're very, very sorry. A brain inside this box decided 
there's a clock here that times out. Okay. We have to wait for this red bar to go away to restart. <laughs> it, it's gradually shrinking. Okay. I deeply apologize. You can tell jokes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about fish. I'll tell okay, you about tell the fish. fish stories. It was fish this stuff. big. <laughs> yeah. So, no, they're this big. Um, so, what you'll see when this comes back on is a, a picture of, um, it's actually a, 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 a picture that was from a nature paper from uh, my colleagues Ian Cousin, Simon Levin, and a couple others. Um, they were Essentially, it was actually a, a simulated story where the model that I showed you at the beginning of the focal fish with the repelling and the attracting, um, they had a whole bunch of them. They were simulating these guys, and, but they were, half of them had a preference to move in one direction, let's call it zero, and the other half had a preference to move in another direction, and they varied that direction from zero all the way up to 180. Okay, so here are these guys, they really want to stick together, right? That's what their underlying rules are, but some want to go here and some want to go here. And what they showed was, um, I can draw it. Oh, there's a pen. Um, but do it on the sideboard. Do it on the sideboard. Thank you. Um, so what they showed was something that looks like this. Um, I mean, I'm superimposing the pitchfork, but what they showed... I feel like I'm uh, on the price is right. <laughs> yeah. This is some kind of test, right? <laughs> um, so this is the, 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 the difference in the angle, right? And basically what they showed was that um, these lines were portrayed because they were, uh, the, co the color intensity was proportional to the probability of which direction the group would go. And it turns out that there was some critical value. So if the, if the two directions were too uh, close to one another, they couldn't distinguish. And they essentially go down the middle, right? But after some critical uh, relative value, they were able to then suddenly, going through this sort of critical point, either with equal probability go one way or the other, essentially depending upon the initial conditions, right? And of course, the bots model in all that kind of things is statistical mechanics. I mean, you have this state transitions, basically, with a critical value. Exactly. So, um, and what's, okay, oh, God, I got it back. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so here's, so here's, here's this picture. What happens when you have um, unequal size groups, you can kind of see, um, it kind of looks like um, what I showed you uh, before, this kind of what we call the unfolding of the pitchfork, what happens when you break that symmetry. Because you still get sometimes going the other way. Um, and it's kind of interesting here, like if you think about this angle, um, he, I mean he, Ian later r ran these experiments with some fish who were attracted to one source of food, I mean they were trained on one, some fish were trained on another, the rest were not trained on any, and he lifts the, you know, the gate and they all swim out and they stick together, and so then he records whether they go this way or this way. But it's kind of interesting because at the beginning, the angle between the two options is really small, so they continue to go straight. It's only when the angle's big enough that they then, so it's kind of like dynamically moving along this bifurcation. Um, okay, so let me tell you the honeybee story, which is super interesting. So um, this is uh, basically the story of honeybees when the nest um, gets over populated about 10,000 of the honeybees leave and they have to find a new nest. They take their queen with them and they hang out on a um, uh, tree in this big swarm and something like three or four percent, so like three or four hundred go out and scout out essentially cavities in trees and they um, uh, Ultimately, they want to pick the best one, and there's a very well um, studied and well understood um, uh, uh, notion of what makes for the best site. It should be something like 40 liters um, in volume. It should have like a 15 centimeter squared opening that's at the bottom of the cavity. The whole cavity should be up high. It should be facing towards the sun, all these kinds of things. Um, and so they do this, um, uh, uh, decision making in this very interesting way. So they use something called the waggle dance, which Carl von Frisch won the Nobel Prize in 1973 for discovering. He found it in the context of um, foraging. Uh, Martin Landauer was his student, studied this. I mean, he literally did experiments running around the city of Munich um, for, the, for the problem of house hunting, finding a new nest site. Um, and, and the story goes like this. So. Uh, um, you know, after a bee uh, checks out a site, she comes back and she does this dance on the vertical part of the swarm. 
And she makes this kind of a, a trajectory, and it kind of looks like that. It looks like this big vibration, because she, what she does is she vibrates her abdomen, um, or I guess she's going this way, and then she does this return loop, and then she vibrates her abdomen, does this return, so it's kind of like a figure eight. Um, but she's communicating three things. She's communicating the direction of the site she visited, the distance, and the quality, which I'll call VI of site, v, uh, of site I. And she does that as follows, like this angle in which she's uh, doing the vibration relative to gravity is the azimuthal angle between the site and the sun. Incredible. The number of vibrations is proportional to the distance and the liveliness, like how fast this is relative to this. And also the number, the total number, um, is the quality. So like 100 is five-star hotel, you know. <laughs> 10 is like a, not a great motel. Um, and so then there's this whole deliberation. So, okay, what do you do with that? So what they're trying to do with the waggle dance is recruit. So, so at the beginning, let's say we have two sites, B is better than A, V, B is greater than V, A. So somebody goes out to A, somebody goes out to B. They all, so they scout, they commit, and then they come back and they start recruiting. They do this dance, um, they go back, so they recruit, they go back, they, they keep going back. Anybody who's been recruited will go back too. Um, but what happens is if they go back and there's, there's not a lot of reinforcement, they'll, their interest will wane. If they go back, however, and there's maybe 25 or 30 at that moment, it's a snapshot, so they, they realize that, they, that there, there's basically a quorum decision. So they say, oh my God, all 25 or 30 of them come back. I don't think they say, oh my God. <laughs> I say, oh my God. They come back and they actually they use a different signal it's called piping. And so basically they, they tell everybody, hey, everybody, we've decided. I don't know how well that would work with people, but they, all the others say, okay, we've decided. And then they all start piping. I mean, they hear the piping and then gradually everybody's piping and then they all move to the site. And they're able to pick the best event. It's been shown, people have written down models. Um, I mean. It, Okay, maybe 99% of the time um, in, in the real world. Uh, we get, actually, my student, uh, Darren Pace, and I got interested in this uh, after we read this paper and then met uh, these folks, started collaborating with um, uh, James Marshall and Hogan, um, that not only are they able to pick best of N, they're able to handle um, when uh, sites have equal value. I mean, this was incredible to me. With the same dynamics, they're able to both pick best of N and maybe flip a coin when they should because they're two good options that have equal value. And so the, these, uh, so Tom Steele is a biologist, did these experiments with equal value sites. He knows what they are so he can make them and, and introduce them to the bees and watch what they do. And this was a signal that had been discovered again in foraging. It's called a stop signal. So here's one guy, they paint them so they know which ones they visited. And so, um, the one who's dancing for one site is gets headbutted literally by like so the pink is going to headbutt the 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 yellow um, so essentially t telling them to stop dancing and to shut up right stop recruiting um, and this is kind of re super interesting so um, Seely and her colleagues wrote down this uh, essentially mean field model well mixed model so y a here is the fraction of the population, say, committed to site A, YB is the fraction committed to site B. Then they write down these dynamics. So the first term is this decay of interest, right? So it's inversely proportional to the value, okay? Um, uh, then there's the commitment that's proportional to the value. Then there's the recruitment, uh, also proportional to the value. And then there's the stop signal, which is gonna, you know, upset in both directions. Um, and we assume, um, that the, they're all you know, do, using stop signaling at the same rate. They've have maybe evolved to stop signal at a, the same kind of rate. So with this kind of model, um, I mean, here's what, if you just simulate these dynamics, so that it lives on this simplex because the YA plus YB plus YU is equal to one, the fractions, right? So this is everybody for uncommitted, everybody for A, everybody for B. These are like quorum levels. Um, so if VB, VB is greater than VA, you get this kind of dynamic that has only one stable equilibrium. Basically, everybody's going for B, which makes sense. But what happens when the values are equal? So now VA is equal to VB is equal to V. So we plug that in. The dynamics look like this. Um, so look what happens if I, have, if I don't change V. So both options have value, let's call it 5. In this case, where I have only a little bit of stop signaling, um, we have just one stable signal, but it's at this perfect indecision, right? 
half of for A and half of for B. Um, but if I increase stop signaling, that indecision becomes unstable. So the, the solid signal, I mean the solid circle is a stable equilibrium. The, the empty circle, the hollow circle is an unstable equilibrium. So this becomes unstable and I get these two stable equilibria. So sort of depending upon initial conditions, I'll go one way or the other, which is like flipping a coin, right? Um, and so then this is what it looks like if you plot um, uh, what happens, this is a projection of what happens as the group, uh, of the group, so why A, everybody's for A at the top, everybody for B at the bottom, as a function of the stop signaling rate. So when it's low, we get just, here blue is stable, red is unstable, so we get just the indecision, Y A equal, Y B is equal to 0.5, and then across this um, critical value, we get a decision. It's already pretty interesting, but here it gets even better. Um, so this critical value, we call this value sensitive decision making because the critical value of sigma, how much stop signaling it takes to start towards a decision, depends, it's inversely proportional, it's like V uh, cubed divided by V to the fourth, so it's inversely proportional to V. So what does that mean? That means if it's higher quality, this critical point moves to the left, which means if I've evolved to, to to you know, um, use this much stop signaling, I'll make a decision. But if the value is low, it'll move to the right, and I won't make a decision. I'll maybe wait for a third option to come along. Because I shouldn't pick. I shouldn't flip a coin if they're really bad, right? I should pick if they're, if they're good. I mean, and you can see this again in this plot where I'm plotting the value as a function of the stop signal. So this line here is, the, is that inverse one over V uh, it's not quite 1 over v, it's this expression. But everything in here is indecision and everything in here we get this, the two decisions. Um, one, f you know, one for uh, each option. Right, so if I'm using, you know, say 1.5 for my stop signaling then, you know, any value um, below, I don't know, 3 point something, um, I'm not going to be able to make a decision, but if, if they're good enough I'll be able to make a decision. And so this is when I start thinking like, well, the sigma, what if it were a control game? What if you could actually, maybe the bees, I don't think he's done the experiments to know whether they change their stop signaling rate, but one could ask th that question. Or if you were designing for robots, you could just design dynamics for sigma, right? And you could, so for instance, we, here's a little simulation where we put in some noise on those rates um, and we're looking at the, you know, what the population's doing as a function of time now for V equal 3, and then here's what I'm doing with sigma over time. I'm basically ramping it up linearly, so it's like I'm moving along my bifurcation plot. In this case, it picks A, right, after I cross this critical threshold, which was 1.7 for, for value of 3. And we get all sorts of really inter other interesting things because of the fact that this is a uh, a pitchfork bifurcation. So this is the story that we know. Let's suppose um, uh, we want to perturb now from equal values, right? So V bar is the average and delta V is the difference between VA and VB. So if I look at this when, when uh, VA is a little bit better than VB, I get this, this you know, perturbed, in fact, what, I'm what I told you sort of at the beginning is that we should expect this, some kind of uh, one of the four unfoldings of the pitchfork bifurcation. Um, and we get all kinds of really interesting robustness uh, features uh, as well as sensitivity features, right? Like what's the slope of this? Where does this thing live as a function of the parameters inside my system? This is showing the, the, the you know, uh, the decision of the group as a function of the difference between these two. So if, if a is a lot better than B, and then it starts to get, um, or B starts to get better too. Um, you cross through zero, you have to cross past zero. V has to get significantly better before you make a, make a change um, of decision. Otherwise, you could be, you know, flitting back and forth between A and B, if, you know, with, with noise over this. So you have this hysteresis that gives you some robustness to fluctuations in the values of these. Um, okay, so let me, um, give you a little bit of background on this singularity theory so that I can, um, I could, I can kind of bring in um, our story. And so, the, so singularity theory sort of starts with this idea of, of what's called the Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction, 
or any kind of reduction that allows you to take your dynamical system and reduce it to a single equation that de describes the solutions of your system. Um, and so here, uh, like a singularity, right, would be a, um, um, a fixed point with the first derivative um, has a zero eigenvalue. So the Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction is essentially like projecting the, di the, the dynamics onto the sort of that eigen space that corresponds to your zero um, eigenvalue. So here G is kind of like this reduced expression for the solution of your system in this, in this singular um, direction. Y is like the reduced scalar state and lambda is a uh, parameter. Um, okay, and so what this um, the theory, so if you look up Goliubitsky and Schaefer's book, it, it basically allows you once you do this reduction to, um, to solve this problem to say what, um, you know, how can I take this and identify what kind of bifurcation I have? Like can I look at some derivatives of this G and just know what kind of bifurcation it is? Because if I can, then I have this, they have this whole classification of all the different qualitative types of bifurcations and they have this idea of how you enumerate all possible perturbations, small perturbations, near this singularity, right? So it's just a way to classify um, and systematize this idea of bifurcations and then what happens as you introduce um, uh, perturbations. So for example, um, you know, we have this G and they can tell you uh, what uh, this capital G, which would be a family of, of uh, a k parameter family of functions, the parameters are alpha one through alpha k, so that when the parameters are zero, you just get your original G. But if you add a perturbation to your solution, then you can write it as this, this uh, expanded function for some value of alpha. It's easier to see it in the example of the pitchfork. So in the pitchfork, the, the normal form for the G just looks like lambda y minus y cubed. So this means that any, any reduced G that you get for your system maps onto this. Right? So this is where we have this idea of how we can sort of rigorously think about all these particularized examples of, of decision making between all two alternatives where there's symmetry, um, giving us a, bifurca a pitchfork bifurcation, how we can connect them. Okay. So this is the picture we get. The recognition problem would be you solve for your G if it satisfies those, those uh, partial derivative conditions, then you know you have a pitchfork bifurcation, you know it's mappable onto this normal form, you know that any perturbation can be expressed in terms of an expanded solution like this, and so if you look, this is the alpha 1, alpha 2 space, so depending upon what kind of perturbation you get, it, could tell, it tells you, given what alpha 1 and alpha 2 is, which of these four possible perturbations you get. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, so that's how I want to approach this, right? I want to define now an abstract model, and actually, I want to define an agent-based model. So, the work with the fish is either uh, uh, computational or experimental. The work with the honeybees is with this sort of well-mixed model. But I'm interested now in asking questions like, what's the role of the network structure on? the decision making? Or what's the role of some heterogeneity, like who prefers what and where they're located in the network on the decision making of the group, right? Well, I can't do that with the, the well-mixed model, which assumes everybody's sensing everybody, but I want to do it like with a network agent-based model, okay? So what I want to do is design a dynamic over here uh, that realizes a G that satisfies these conditions, I essentially want this to have a pitchfork bifurcation because then I have a rigorous way to map and I can really think, I can think in a mathematical sense of how these systems are connected, right? And I can then, I can then uh, move between them. So I could, if I, if I can map from this G to the G that I get for uh, my honeybees or my fish and then I can think about using this model in the context of design. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. And um, here's the model. And this is joint with Alessio Franci, who's at um, uh, uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico, assistant professor Vaya Paz Rivestava, who's former postdoc and at uh, assistant professor at MSU, Michigan State, and Beck Gray, who's a current uh, PhD student. Um, so uh, 
let's assume we have n agents now, okay? Um, Xi is now going to be a scalar opinion of the i th individual, and I'm going to think about now if, if it's positive, it's for alternative A, if it's negative, it's for alternative B, if it's exactly zero, it's completely uncommitted. Um, and I'm going to assume that they're connected through a network. Um, I'm going to think about the state of the group as just the average of the opinions of the group. Um, but I'm going to be interested in decisions in which there's some agreement, right? So this is basically telling me that either everybody is uncommitted or their opinions are all either positive or all negative if, if delta is equal to zero. Okay, so how do I design dynamics that realize a pitchfork bifurcation? Well, okay, so here's the dynamics for the ith individual. That's the vector field capital F for xi dot. Uh, I'm going to assume that, I mean, I, I'm going to choose dynamics so that indecision, when all the opinions are equal to zero, satisfies um, this equation for any u, meaning that it's an equilibrium for any value of, of uh, a control u. Okay, so these are the conditions on my vector field. I need symmetry in the options, right? So that's just going to translate when I think about how do I get symmetry. It just translates into this, it's called S2 equ equivariance. It just means that, uh, it basically means that my, my vector field should be odd in x, right? Minus f of x u should be equal to f minus x u. I should also have this singularity at my indecision, right? That's where I want the bifurcation point to be. So when I take the Jacobian and I evaluate it at indecision, for, for some value of u star, it should be singular, and I want to have <coughs> agreement. Okay, so and here's the model that, that we use. Okay, so the first term, so this is xi dot. This is how an individual is changing its opinion. Beta i is like a preference, or maybe it could be some information coming from the external world. Right now, it's just a constant. Um, uh, di is, is like the in degree. It's the sum of um, the, the edges in the graph. So this, these are weights that tell you how the ith individual is, is um, weighting the information it's getting from the jth individual. So, uh, so that's kind of like a, a, a negative feedback, right? And then we have this um, uh, positive social feedback term. Um, so we have our weights, and then we're taking a sigmoid um, a saturation function of the opinions that are coming in from the neighbors that I can sense. And we're also um, scaling that by u, right? Which is kind of interesting here. So we have a negative feedback, and we have a positive feedback, and u, which I'm going to call like a social effort. It's kind of like our sigma. Um, you can kind of imagine if I crank up uh, the social feedback, I might make something that was stable into something that was unstable by, by pushing eigenvalues from one side of the, um, the plane to the other side. And that's precisely what happens here. So here's those very same dynamics written in vector form, right? And they satisfy these three conditions, right? So minus dx and this sigmoidal function, they're all odd functions, right? So we get this symmetry. We get, in an interesting way, the singularity at indecision because when we plug in um, indecision, our equations look like this. And when u is equal to 1, I only need the singularity at a, at a certain value of my control, um, I, get, I get d minus d minus a. So for those of you who work on network systems, this is called the Laplace, and it's, a, it's just a way to encode who's sensing whom. And we know for a connected graph, it has a single zero eigenvalue, right? That's our singularity. And in fact, we get the agreement because that, remember, we're going to project on that direction. That's our... Uh, our consensus direction. So in fact, we're basically creating a pitchfork on the consensus manifold where xi is equal to xj. So we're getting our agreement and we're getting this whole story. So we use um, uh, our theory, this, the singularity theory, to uh, prove a theorem about what happens, which is basically um, that, um, uh, first of all, when beta is not when we have no beta, when there's no um, preferences, indecision is this globally asymptotically stable um, uh, solution. So it's, it's like the arm of the pitchfork when u is greater than, I mean, less than 1, right? So u equal 1 is like our critical value here. Um, and then um, when, it's, uh, when u is greater than 1, uh, we get these three solutions that we can just compute uh, from the scalar equation when y 
uh, intersects with s of u s of y. So when u is less than one, it won't intersect, right? When it's greater than one, we'll get these intersections. And those would be the these two stable branches. And we get other really interesting things. So when beta is not equal to zero, we want to understand what the influence is of individuals on the decision. And the way we inter we understand that is kind of like the way this unfolds when we have um, asymmetry, right? Remember, we get this decision. Like, which way does it even go? Um, because, you, you know, you might have three guys who are for A and three guys for B, but doesn't it depend on where they are? And in fact, this tells us that. It tells us how our G, the derivative of G with respect to information heterogeneously applied, depends upon this Ci, which is the ith component of the, the left eigenvector associated with the zero eigenvalue. It's called eigenvector centrality for those of you used to these centrality measures in network systems. I'll show you some examples. Um, we also look at the case in which, which is more, makes more sense for a distributed system, that everybody has their own ui. So like right now I'm thinking about a single scalar u, uh, but if everybody is controlling their own social effort, um, um, we can solve the same kind of problem, and now the bifurcation parameter will be the average of the UIs. Okay, so it's easier to explain in pictures. So here is here are 12 guys that are connected through some undirected graph. Um, nobody has any preference. Those are going to be the open circles. We get our pitchfork bifurcation as promised, <laughs> or as proved. Um, now we give like four guys that prefer A, three guys prefer um, uh, B, it's an undirected graph, and so the majority is, is going to win out, okay? Um, we get the same kind of hysteresis. This is all coming straight out of bifurcation theory. If you have a pitchfork bifurcation, you get this kind of hysteresis. So now it's in uh, the, the, the difference in the strengths of these preferences, okay? So if there's fluctuation, we won't, we won't have to worry about, uh, we can be robust to that. Also, so that, that third result of the theorem, if we still have four guys for A and three guys for um, B, but we, we mess around with the, the network structure, so now it's directed, and um, so edges have changed a little bit. In this example, we get the, sort of the non-intuitive result. So the four guys for A lose out. <laughs> the three guys are just more central in the sense of eigenvector centrality. And so our theory predicts that these, these three guys will win, that the group will go for B more readily than for A. Um, we also get interesting things. So um, in this case, we have four for A, four for B, and four don't have a preference. And the, you know, the, the, the ones with preferences don't talk to each other. And so we have all this nice symmetry. There's, it, you know, there's preferences, but we still have symmetry, so we get the symmetric pitchfork when beta is equal to one. But now we get something interesting that happens just because we increase the magnitude, so how, how, um, how much they prefer. And we get, this is a subcritical bifurcation, which I think is kind of interesting, because remember, if we, if we think about like, giving dynamics to you, here it's this kind of soft decision. It's very slow, right? But here we would get what we might call a hard decision, right? Like you're moving along and then you jump up to the stable solution and then you decrease as you jump down. Or you could do oscillations or you could jump down here um, if there's a little bit of noise. Um, and you could imagine like an allocation problem even where you're switching regularly between two options. Um, we also can recover the value sensitive decision making. So this is very similar to what we have before. So here this uh, uh, new I is um, uh, like a preference. Um, so there are N that are for A, N that are for B, and there's N3 agents that don't have a preference. But I have added a 1 over nu on the, um, the, the negative feedback term. That's kind of like the inversely proportional um, waning of interest to the value of the site. Um, so here it's, they're equal value sites. Um, and we can, um, in this model, we assume just for the moment that everybody is sensing everybody so that we can actually write down an expression for where this bifurcation point lives so that you can see the inverse proportionality to the value. So we, we're trying to recover, you know, a result like this, like that sigma star, remember, so that we can see things like 
as you increase the value of the bifurcation moves here. In fact, it also opens up, right? So you're going to more quickly make a decision than, than out here. Um, but we can do other things now because we see sort of the dependence of the number of, of individuals. In the well-mixed model, you just assume there's huge number of individuals right here. We can see how n plays in. We can see how like the number of, of individuals who don't have a preference versus those who do plays in. For instance, as n3 increases for the same fixed total number, um, you make it easier to make a decision. You have less individuals who, who care, who have a preference. Um, Okay, and then finally, we can, we can finish this story with where, I, where I've been pushing it, which is that we can, we can derive some um, dynamics for, um, for the U's. So here I'm going to think about the case in which I have n individuals, and now I'm going to think about U as a vector. Each individual has a control over their own social effort, and they're going to modify it um, perhaps in response to some trigger from the environment. Um, and so here are the original dynamics. Here now U is a diagonal matrix with all the U's. Um, and um, this is a little estimator, so individuals aren't going to know what the average opinion or the decision of the group is, so they're going to estimate it. And then they're going to control their social effort to make sure, suppose they've realized that they've they got to get going, they've got to make a decision to drive their, um, uh, their estimate above some threshold. Um, whether it's positive or negative, they, they want to make sure that the, the group makes a decision. So here's an example of what happens. The, the, uh, the, these little dashed uh, black lines are the opinions of individuals that start all over the place, and they join, they come together at indecision as the, the average of the use is growing. And, um, and then in this case, they made a choice for, the, for A, for the positive decision. This is really interesting version of singular perturbation theory because of this singularity. Um, there's an interesting delay. Um, okay, so, um, you know, these ideas have actually permeated some other work that I've done. I just wanted to mention this because I said it at the beginning that working with biologists is really um, generative and working with um, social scientists. I've also been doing a lot of work with um, composers and in particular choreographers, so thinking about, uh, in this case, this was a recent um, uh, structured improvisational dance that I worked on with um, Rebecca Leja and Dan Truman, choreographer and composer, um, in which dancers on the fly make improvisational decisions among a set of options, um, and they're making artistic choices where there's this really interesting tension between um, choices that kind of allow them, it's actually kind of like an explore exploit to, to dig into what's going on um, on stage or to add something new to the performance. And um, it was really fascinating. We did, we did kind of manipulations during rehearsals. We developed a, we developed a model um, using, um, this is the replicator mutator dynamics from evolutionary dynamics. So we're now where strategies are these choreographed um, uh, uh, modules that, we, that the dancers um, choose amongst, so they're like motion primitives that they're, they're choosing amongst. Um, and what we did the same kind of thing, like we, in our model, we're feeding back a bifurcation parameter, so there's a pitchfork bifurcation in this story because in this case they have, um, um, at, at a time, they have a, a, an option between two, um, two choices. Um, and so we were able to create the kind of uh, dynamics that we saw here, and then we were able to think about how to create choreographic, you know, dials so that the choreographer, without micromanaging, could uh, influence the texture and sort of pacing of the, of the dance. Um, and we also developed um, new kinds of rules that she ended up using in practice so that the dancers would develop interesting new ways, sort of new ways to think about um, creative choices uh, that ended up showing up in the performance. This was actually premiered two years ago in New York, um, in, a, in a theater in New York City. Um, but it's kind of interesting, it's also given us um, this, um, um, th you know, we're thinking ahead to how you generalize this to more than two options. So this is the, this is the transcritical bifurcation associated with like symmetry of three uh, options um, or three subgroups who have um, uh, three different uh, th equally sized um, options. So there's lots of interesting things to be done there. But let me summarize. Um, 
So I hope I've convinced you that there's, at least in this context of collective animal behavior, um, there's much to learn from nature. I actually think it's, there's stories out there in so many different domains. Um, um, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm excited about this story about instability and bifurcation. I also think that this is applicable in lots of different settings, um, this idea of, of making transitions from one something's very stable to something else stable, but allowing a system to pass through an instability to get there, to be flexible and to respond to something that's changing in the environment, like the value of something is going up or um, a social effort is uh, responding to like an impatience to make a decision. Um, I mean, this whole, this whole story has to do with nonlinear dynamics. I think it's, it's interesting in this context to think about the fact that any given moment in this setting, you know, the animals have an opinion, right? So it's not this kind of dis discrete, did they choose A or B? But, you know, we can see the dynamics in the model and, you know, individuals might be changing their minds. I mean, there's a, a way to, to, like, query a system and say, where do you stand now? <laughs> um, it's not just a, a, a discrete kind of thing. And also the fact that the dynamics are smooth, that we can um, um, imagine how, you know, best of N and uh, flipping a coin can all come out of one set of dynamics rather than having to, to have to think, you know, plan A, plan B, if then, which is, then gets hard to, to verify. Um, and then I guess finally, um, I wanted to make the point about, um, well, generalized models, but also this idea of collaboration across disciplines, which I think is incredibly rich and exciting. So, um, and that, that was my little plug about not just, not even just biology, um, but even, you know, even uh, the humanities. Um, so let me just thank uh, my group, uh, my husband and two daughters who, um, inspire me all the time as well, and um, my funding uh, support. <laughs> Thank you. Can you answer some questions? Um, yeah, sure. I'm sorry to cut so close into the time. Oh, no, that's OK. We're, uh, we have all the time uh, that you wish. Oh, I'm, to, I'm, uh, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, I see. Chris uh, Signal, you might have a question. <laughs> okay, away. this obviously applies to Facebook and Twitter, <laughs> except instead of decay of the individual, we mm. have a positive feedback that we mm. become more extreme over time. I want to know whether this stuff works under those conditions, uh, and how are you going to get the Russians into the Mm. You know, at one point I was thinking about these, um, you know, like doing some of the stuff that we do on the real line, like on, from, from, you know, zero to one or minus one to one on the circle, right? Because if you, if you go all the way around, you know, yeah. that the extremes can meet in the other direction, right? So maybe that's one way to think about it. <laughs> but can it, can it work if everybody becomes more extreme? Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting question. So, I mean, in our model, yeah, you could model um, like crazy high preferences, right? So those betas might be good measures um, uh, of somebody being really intransigent. Um, yeah, it kind of depends uh, what you mean by extreme and, and whether our model can handle it, I don't know, yeah. In the bees, who's controlling the sigma? or the temperature or whatever. Yeah, so the sigma, I mean, so as far as we know, it, it could be that sigma is just fixed once and for all. They may have evolved to use stop signaling at some certain rate. I mean, uh, I mean the experiment they, that Tom Seeley did was essentially, um, he had two of these, these um, man, you know, him made <laughs> cavities. Um, I mean, they're made them out of wood, these boxes that they go and uh, check out, and he just makes them about the same uh, quality. And then he watches what happens, um, and they use the stop signaling. But I mean, and that already took gobs of time, right? So I don't think he's gone and then run an experiment to see if you change the conditions or if you, um, you know, how do you understand whether sigma can change over time. But it might be that we can, we can try to understand something like that in a different, um, in a different species, right, where there's something similar. 
where there's this, I mean, so there's a speed accuracy trade-off for these honeybees in some sense, although accuracy absolutely dominates. So they do have some time. They will wait for a good option. Um, so it's not clear when they would have to start increasing this. In his setting, so he does these experiments on an island in Maine that has no trees. So these are only the two, right? So maybe, maybe, maybe they do um, up that rate if they're, if they're not making the decision. Um, because waiting for a third, I mean, he, 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 because they can read the waggle dance signal, if somebody, one of the bees finds a rogue <laughs> cavity somewhere, the graduate student sitting and watching the, the swarm will remove, I mean, you'll see that this is not. That's the Russians. <laughs> 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 All right, I got it. <laughs> what assumptions are you making about communication, communication signal propagation rather than just the connectivity of the graph? Yeah, I mean, right now, that's, there's nothing very interesting in there, right? It's, we're just yeah. assuming, that, um, okay. but yeah. Uh, all, you know, all delays and all those kinds of things. I mean, we, I mean, but that's what you can do once you have an agent-based model, you can start putting that in. You can't do it with the original one. So our, the first step was to try to just segue from this setting where we can't ask those kinds of questions to one where we can start asking those questions. We just haven't, in this setting, asked that question yet. So I, I'm. So what do they want to do? <laughs> so it's so a bunch of bees, maybe. And yeah. Some of them want to wear like one type of shirt and another type of shirt. So you have the same, these same sorts of dynamics, but then you have it hierarchically. So you have maybe like they have to pick out another thing, combinations of those things. I see. So, so they want to make it. Spaces of decisions. And so there's there's multiple parameters that they want to make decisions yeah, yeah. over. And with, with that they're doing it in sequence? Is that what you're asking? Or maybe in sequence or maybe in some way? Like, um, has that kind of question been addressed? Or? In the context of honeybees? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so like, well, we look at sequential decision, like the, in the multi-armed bandit story, right? We look at individuals making sequence of decisions among n options. Um, so I mean, if, is that kind of close to what you're thinking about, or? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I was just I really enjoyed your talk. I, I Thanks. The fish tank and the multi-armed bandit studies. I, I was, you know, I wanted to understand more about what you were expecting to see with a more biomimetic system that you wouldn't see in silico. Like what's what's there that you don't get in the simulation? Or is it just that it's computationally expensive to do the sort of simulation you wanted to do? Um, what you get, you mean when you watch real animals versus um, a simulated? Is that what you're asking? Yes, but didn't you have like robot fish? Oh, yeah. And, and so I guess the question was, oh, just you like, saw that. <laughs> the animals you would look at, you'd be like, okay, I'm actually looking deeply and I'm seeing yeah. something new. And you're looking for behavioral traits. Too. Yeah. But okay, so, so robots, the robot fish, yeah, so what we did, <laughs> so this was a while ago, we had, um, uh, you know, fish in this shallow tank, and then we um, made a little, it was like a cast of an already dead fish that was on like a little sled with a magnet, and then we put a robot under, so the, the tank was off the ground, and then the robot had a magnet. So essentially we could drag this thing around. It was a lot easier than building like an articulated swimming fish. And the whole idea was that, so then we had, you know, like, uh, cameras overhead so we could do the processing so that we could compute things about the group like where is the center of mass? Could we estimate some kind of like perimeter of the group and um, originally we wanted this little fake fish to be like the real fish but it's so hard to get fish to accept this thing that doesn't smell look nothing like a real fish you know I mean we tried but so then we ended up making that fish into a um, predator right which is a lot easier, right? some threat. I don't, it might not even be, they might not think it's a fish, it's just something scary. Um, but we, then we could try little algorithms like, you know, have it head for the center of mass of the group or have it wait till the closest fish, you know, 
Um, so the, the idea was to try to introduce some feedback into the system. So we're doing, um, so we work with Ian Cousin, I don't know if you know, Ian is a, he works on collective animal behavior, he was at Princeton for a lot of years, but um, he's at Max Planck in Constance, Germany now, and he uh, does all kinds of really interesting things with like um, holograms and things like that, so that you can suddenly now get uh, control over fish that are swimming with other fish. Um, but the idea is to try to in insert some feedback to see, um, like, like design some feedback rules for the, the fake fish to see if you've got it right, like see if they can swim with them or see how they'll react to them. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, because we, we uh, so he showed me this data and we ended up writing a paper about this fish that um, seemed to oscillate in their velocities. So they would accelerate and then they'd decelerate and then accelerate and decelerate. And then when you looked at pairs of them, they were doing it out of phase. So if you were moving with them, it looked like they were kind of doing like this. I mean, crazy, right? So then we try to understand what they were doing. Um, and so then we try to think about creating uh, fake ones to do this kind of oscillating out of phase to see if we could get them to dance with us or mess it up, these kinds of things. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of uh, dynamics that you can explore um, if you can have some control over it. I mean, that's working with animals is hard and you know that's why it's fun to work with biologists who are really good at coming up ways to train them or get acclimate them and, um, yeah I have a question oh yeah go ahead so i'm fairly sure this was in your presentation but i just want to hear for you to make sure i'm not like, coming up with stuff that uh, you actually say so does does your research suggest like good rules for individual behavior to improve group decision making um, that's the goal, yeah. So the idea is that we're trying to understand something fundamental about what's going on in all these d particularized systems, right? And um, in order to do that, it's really helpful to get a model um, that, um, that realizes something about it so that we can then ask those questions, like what is it about those roles? So, because we have all these different kinds of systems which have in principle different kinds of you know, phenomena, um, what we decided was that what they have in common is this you know, sort of fundamental decision making picture. So if we, we derive a, a sort of a, sort of a generic -y model, right? we haven't really put much into our little agent based model, but then we can use it to, to focus in and ask deeper questions about what might be going on, what might be explaining you know, why the fish are really good at all, you know, heading for the better food or heading the direction where they'll, you know, higher probability of avoiding the predator or the, you know, honeybees, how they do what they're doing. Um, or like the birds, when, when is it the best time to take off when we've stopped for our rest stop when we're migrating or there's tons of these questions that are just these binary decisions. And um, so we want to understand how to develop you know, from this model, a systemat systematic way to design. Um, and But we can go back and forth. So we can even learn from the design and then might lead us to say, well, wait a second, you know, we had this heterogeneous group. What, is that, um, what does that mean for, you know, for this group of fish? Maybe they're all different. Um, can we ask some new questions there? We can also take it outside the, the parameter regime because it might be, you know, it's sort of win-win. Like if, if, even if Ian tells me that it's not what the animals are doing, I can I can still take it out of that that biological regime and make it work for the robots. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I was simply asking for like a single decision made process for like a group of humans, like because uh -huh. so yeah, it's a very good answer that the idea is to be more general than that. Yeah. For for like humans, just like making a decision as you know five person yeah, this is. Are there are there good rules that you like learned from this? Ah. Uh, not uh, obvious already from other disciplines. Um. Yeah, I mean, I. You know, I, I, you know, mapping from honeybees to people. I mean, I. You know, if you read Tom Seeley's Honeybee Democracy book, mm -hmm. he makes this point about this. But you know, the the bees are all related. You know, 
I mean, I don't know if you're going to ask somebody to like headbutt the other person. I guess you could well, have. That's, that's what Twitter is all about. Well, right. Oh, I guess that's true. You, like you limit how many words they have, and um, uh, I suppose they could be guiding principles to try to experiment with, like a starting point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it is. I mean, there are principles for how you you can pick best event and flip a coin. We're rarely bad at flipping coins, aren't we? I mean. Congress will never make a decision, right? Ever. So, um, you know, maybe this is one way. I don't know. I think maybe this is a good time. I will suggest we wrap it up. Okay. And, uh, You're supposed to let us collectively make that decision. Oh, okay. Everybody who agrees with me, let's give her a big hand. <laughs> <laughs> you were actually supposed to say.